You're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at www.kpfa.org. The time is 7 o'clock. Stay tuned for Apex Express. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express. Tonight we'll learn about unique musical forms being revived among Asian Americans. We'll hear about a percussion ensemble from the southern Philippines and about a youth Chinese orchestra with a very special student, plus music, calendar, and more. And don't forget the live Apex API Hip Hop Show at Lux Arts tonight, right after this show. My name is Curtis, but first we have a feature about an incident that happened in early June. Several men from Lodi, California, were taken by the FBI on suspicion of ties to terrorists. These Pakistani men, two are U.S. citizens, are being detained on charges of lying to the FBI and on possible immigration violations. The Bureau said that it was standing by allegations against the men. Time will tell with what we come up with, said an agent. Dina Dubal is a lawyer and a member of the South Asian Civil Rights Organization, ASATA. She was in Lodi and was trying to help the Pakistani community there. Here, Dubal speaks of what happened in the aftermath of the arrest and how she and other people and organizations like the Japanese American Citizens League, or JACL, and Muslim and civil rights organizations like the Lawyers Committee are trying to help people in an atmosphere of fear and suspicion. Yeah, so when you went to Lodi, you were mentioning with... uh that there was like this sense of fear, or I don't know if that's quite the right word for it. The city really felt besieged in many ways. It's, you know, it's a really small town, so mm-hmm. upon entrance to the town, we immediately met with the ACLU attorneys. There's no driving around. And then within seconds of meeting with the ACLU attorneys, we saw a man in a huge fake wig um, and a blue SUV circling um, uh, the hotel, the hotel room that um, the ACLU attorneys were using as their headquarters, consistently circling every time they could, he could get an opportunity to take a picture. And the, the interesting thing about that to me was that um, here I'm not being surveyed in a way that is secret in any way. It's an, it's an act of intimidation. You see someone who is very obvious. Um, he was trying to make us notice him. I think my, my sense was that he was that they were trying to make us know that they were watching what we were doing, that we were watching our activities, and that maybe we should feel scared also, despite the fact that we were there to ensure that constitutional rights and civil liberties were um, were upheld. Uh, was like an FBI person, or was it was like just somebody who misconstrued patriotism enabled them to do something? His car resembled the FBI cars that we saw near the mosque. Um, what, what do FBI cars look like? Well, I wouldn't have known except for that um, the mosque members pointed them out to me and they stood very conspicuously on this block. Um, the mosque is on the same block as the cannery where many of the Pakistani men and women work. Also near uh, a boys and girls, girls club, sort of more lower income area, there were these really large SUVs parked Um, large tinted SUVs parked in various places. They were parked never directly in front of the mosque, but on the side streets. Um, when When we got to the mosque, actually, one of the mosque members said to us, I said, are you okay? You know, mm-hmm. And his first response was, you know, let them come talk to us. We have nothing to hide. Let them ask questions. We have absolutely nothing to hide. One, another man, without looking, said, if you look to your left behind that tree, you'll see an SUV. If you look to your right, you'll see an SUV. And if you look behind, you'll see one. Those are all FBI cars. The Pakistani-American community, actually, I guess the broader South Asian community, what were some of the reactions they're feeling? On the outside, there was this shell of 
we're going to go about our daily business mm -hmm. and we're going to continue attending our mosque mm -hmm. and we're going to continue, continue expressing our right to worship and, um, and we're not going to change anything. On the other hand, after getting to speak with them a little bit a little bit longer, I got the sense that people were so scared. One man who was interrogated three times, this is a professional man that was interrogated three times, said, you know, I have nothing to hide. I don't I don't care if they ask me questions, but every time they take me away, it scares my wife and children. So they take when when he said take him away, did he say that they took him out of his house to do the questioning or into the car or I did get the um the notion that they were taken from their places of employment so that they were then afraid to go back to their places of employment because their coworkers would view them suspiciously. Um, they were taken from their homes many times. I don't know where they were taken to speak. However, I do know that when they were taken by the attorneys to the hotel room where the attorneys were headquartered, this is the ACLU attorneys, to talk to them about what had gone on, they were followed. They were surveyed outside the hotel room and then followed back to their home or place of employment. Now, were you yourself, you and Sonina went up, you're both uh, South Asian descent, were you also under surveillance, given the way you guys just look? Yeah, it was interesting. We were actually with a, a Muslim attorney who um, wore hijab, whose head was covered, and then with two, um, two white people. One was an ACLU attorney and the other was his intern. And, um, and we were discussing how we thought that our perception of how we were treated in the community would, was very different based on the fact that we were with two professionally dressed white people. The only time I felt extraordinarily intimidated was when we were harassed by the FBI. Um, at the hotel and when I was at the mosque because there was this sense that you were just being watched constantly that even, you know, I had this, you were asking me earlier what, what it was, what it, what it is that makes someone stand up and say this is wrong and part of what I've discovered for myself in this, in the course of these, these last few weeks that has made me want to speak out and want to make me do something, but when I spoke with the with the men at the mosque, I realized these were my uncles in some sense, you know. Though they came from a Pakistani Muslim community, we could communicate the same language. Um, they looked very similar to me. They Their experience in America was very similar to mine. They were racialized in the same way that I was racialized. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. The outside larger American community, meaning people who aren't South Asian, view us the same way. They're not aware of our ethnic differences, of our um, religious differences. Another thing is that I realized that a lot, a lot of the South Asian community didn't mobilize in any um, prolific way around these events. And How come you think people didn't mobilize? The biggest and most important reason is because this was in Lodi. This was somewhere that was not in a big city. To go out there would have been um, would have been just logistically difficult and this is what the I think this is strategic in some ways that the government is focusing in on communities that are not um, big town America so that little town America also feels scared right you should still be scared because any brown person in your community might be a terrorist mm -hmm. I also think that people didn't mobilize because they were just scared because we are all racialized the same way going into a town where you could be perceived as a member of the community that's being surveyed you all also are then subject to surveillance as we were. I think it's my responsibility to go in and do work that other people cannot do. I, I've, I had several um, Pakistani American activists send me emails saying we really wanted to go but we couldn't because we were scared. I, um, whether I'm wrong about this or not, feel really protected because I don't have a Muslim name and that's, I mean, that's how people are categorized mm -hmm. this, these days. And this whole thing about racialization, is there anything that happened to you personally that made you feel this way? I had a very close friend, actually, that was, that is um, a sick American. Just being with him constantly and having people call him Osama, having people, um, once someone punched him in the nose on the street and told him, watch out, Osama. I also come from Kentucky. Um, on July 4th, there are firecrackers in our mailbox on um, Christmas. This little snowman that my brother would build outside our house would be torn down. My father was consistently flicked off, called a terrorist. And these, these things happened before and after September 11th. And maybe it was, I think, it was really emphasized to me over and over again that no matter how educated I became, no matter how much money I had, that 
nothing could protect me from being viewed as, or, or my loved ones from being viewed as, um, as people who didn't belong and being subject to a violent threat because they didn't belong. Uh, your brother made a snowman and people would uh, take it down. Or did, how did you know it was just not kids having fun? Things like this happened on a weekly basis. You know, someone, we had lions outside our house and some kid knocked one over, or then another kid stole one of the lions and um, our our house was constantly toilet papered, constantly egged, our cars were egged. When were cars, when I was growing up, cars were keyed. This is no one else's car is being mm -hmm. keyed. When, when you were talking about your friend getting uh, punched in the nose, was that in San Francisco? I was actually on the streets of Berkeley talking to this friend of mine afterwards, after the incident, um, I realized that it wasn't so much this isolated incident that bothered him, it was that when he got up off the ground and there was blood everywhere that no one helped, that people just watched. After a few, a few minutes, I think, an uh, uh, elderly Latina um, janitor came up to him and gave him a towel and patted him on the shoulder and it was the only sign of kindness that he had seen in that, that whole you know 10 minute span and that sort of complacency on a small basis is something that we're seeing in Lodi on a larger basis. There hasn't been a lot that has changed since September 11th as far as the community goes, as mm -hmm. far as how they're being targeted by the larger community and by the government. Mm -hmm. There's, if anything, things have gotten worse. Mm -hmm. um, and what's scary about that is that this sort of violence is becoming more and more insidious, right? It's becoming more and more isolated. So what is the next step for you to try and rectify the situation? And the most immediate steps, I think, are um, that Asatha is going to take is we're compiling a list of attorneys to, um, who are interested in doing pro bono work, mm -hmm. who people in the community, um, South Asian community, can contact mm -hmm. if they are subject to hate violence or if they're interrogated by the FBI. Your responsibility within that is to compile the list or are you doing other things too? Right, so I'm compiling this list, um, and we're going to try and append it to the back of Know Your Rights flyers, go to the places of worship in Lodi and the surrounding areas, the Gurdwaras, the mosques, the mandirs, and, um, and hand out this, these flyers. Let the community know that we're out there, that these attorneys are out there, that if they need help or if they have any questions, that they have access to these people. Because this is another thing, is that because you're isolated in Lodi, you don't have access to the attorneys who know how to deal with the FBI. You don't have access to the attorneys who know how to um, deal with this, these types of civil rights issues. Um, so one of, these, one of the things is we want to make sure that the community doesn't feel isolated and that they, um, they feel like they have networks that are beyond just their small town. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're really trying to do, and hopefully this will be a, um, a consistent and long-term effort, is to become organized in the, most, um, in the most real sense of the term. We're trying to form alliances with CARE, with the Council for American Islamic Relations, trying to form alliances with other organizations like the JACL, who have been really great and um, reacted quickly and responsibly to, this, to these issues so that in the event that these things happen again, and they inevitably will, um, we can show our force in large numbers immediately mm -hmm. so that our stance is taken immediately so that the FBI knows immediately that they can't survey like this, that they can't deny people the right to an attorney when they're doing interrogations. They can't not read their Miranda warnings if there's a detention that they have to be responsible about the way that they go about their investigation. I think that um, being organized in large numbers is a vital step in counteracting this sort of um, insidious governmental violence. We are going to hear a soundbite from an exhibit called Disappeared in America. The most recent story is um, on March the 1st, uh, my husband was picked up uh, from his place of employment um, by the INS officials and was taken to a detention uh, center. Um, I received a call from my husband um, like later on that evening, Friday evening, telling me that um, they had um, came to the job to pick him up and um, they had him in the detention. So um, I went on to contact other people, you know, on the reason why he was there. And to this day, I haven't got a reason why he was being in detention, no less and for the reason for his deportation. Let me see. That was that Monday morning or Tuesday morning, last time I spoke with my husband. So after that, I was, 
that night I was waiting on my husband to call. He didn't call. The next day my husband didn't call. But at any rate, they couldn't find no trace of my husband. My husband was in his system. They claimed they look all in the holding cells and everything. At this point, we beginning to get worried around where my husband is, you know. So the lawyer called all the detention centers in the jails, in New York, Baton Rouge, everywhere, looking for my husband. No trace of my husband. So I was at my job, and uh, I received a phone call. And the phone call was from my sister-in-law in Pakistan. And she was just yelling my name, you know, Patricia, Patricia, Jerry is in Islamabad. And on his trip to Pakistan, on the plane, he was telling me that they had him shackled. They had their hands and their legs. They couldn't go to the restroom. My husband asked repeatedly to um, use the phone to call his attorney and to call me. They had like a hundred and some detainees in one room that only hold a capacity of maybe 15 people. When he was like in detention at Prairie View or Prairie, Louisiana, whatever the jail is, you know, he was not allowed to take showers. He was not allowed to even make a phone call. And from my understanding and how it's supposed to be in this quote unquote American way, I could go out and kill somebody. I'm allowed one phone call. That wasn't the case for him. He hasn't done anything, and they wouldn't allow him to make a call. And on top of that, this was a secret deportation. It was a secret flight. It was a secret flight that they had, so that could play the role in it, too, why they didn't want them to make a phone call. They didn't want them to take a shower and, you know, and got them all crammed up in one room, like 130 people in a room that hold a capacity of 15 people, at 15, 20 people at the max. I mean, that was torture. Had them chained and shackled and, you know, then on the plane, wouldn't allow them to eat, wouldn't allow them to use the restroom. They asked them to use the restroom, say it's 630 now, they probably won't let them use the restroom to 730. You know, I mean, it just was that kind of torture, and on the plane they was calling them criminals and, you know, go back to your country and, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. So I'm just right now in the process of trying to get the affidavit of support, being that I'm unemployed and, you know, I mean, they took the backbone of the house from us, you know, it's going to be two years in March, and, you know, just trying to survive has been a really a big struggle for me and my daughter trying to keep a roof over our head and, you know, do things. And all we did, all my husband did in this country was work and try to, you know, make a better life for ourselves. We just heard a true story in the aftermath of special registrations post 9-11 of mostly Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Muslim men. This clip is from Disappeared in America, an exhibit that is also online, and you can hear more about this exhibit during our calendar of events, so stay tuned. This is G, and if you want to get a hold of us, please go to apex at kpfa.org, or you can call 510-848-6767, extension 464. This is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. This is Apex Express. You're listening to G right here on KPFA and KPFB and KFCF in Fresno. I want to say we...
And that track was called Ascent by Dub Gabriel. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, your Asian Pacific Islander voice. Stay tuned. This is Apex Express. You're listening to G. I'm here on KPFA and KPFB and KFCF in Fresno. I want to say we are going to be listening to a very special kind of music, music that you don't hear too often, not even in Asia and not even here in the U.S., but it has a growing following in the United States, especially among the Filipino-American community. It's called Kulintan Music, and it's related to the music in the southern part of Asia. Berkeley, the Palambunian Kulintong Ensemble, led by Danny Kalanduyan, played at UC Berkeley's first museum. There, Danny gave an introduction to the Kulintong, its history, and what it consists of. And this is the pre-colonial tradition of the southern Philippines, specifically performed by the Maguindanao, the Maranao, Tausu, and other uh, Filipinos in southern part of the Philippines on the island of Mindanao. And this is a music that was already in the Philippines long before the Spaniards came in 1521. This is a pre-colonial tradition, pre-Islamic, pre-Spanish, and people in Mindanao are still strongly practice this music. performed for all kinds of occasions in Mindanao, specifically among my people. The smaller ensemble of Kulintang, even though it's related to the Balinesian and Indonesian and Malaysian larger gong ensembles, its smaller configuration allows improvisation and flexibility. Indonesia is similar, but the music is, not, is totally different. We only happen to share similar type of instrument. They are all made of bombs. In waiting, for example, in Mindanao, it is considered incomplete among my people without the performance of this type of music. The music is also used to perform and uh, to accompany a dance. Dancers also performed with the Palabuni and Kuntong Ensemble. The dances performed were similar to the martial arts movement that's found in the southern part of the Philippines and also found in places like Malaysia and Indonesia. The dances also performed one that includes a trance-like dance that used to be performed and is found less and less as other influences crowd out the traditional music of the Philippines. Introduce the name of the instrument, and we will start with these four hanging gongs. And this is uh, called gandingan, and the people use it not only as an accompaniment of the uh, ensemble, but they also use it for send a message. We can communicate, we can send a message to our neighbors, your friends, by using this instrument. So uh, it sounds this uh, uh, too. Next 
instrument we have here, this is the uh, main uh, lead of the ensemble, and they call it Kolintang. So it's a, a, a row of eight gongs, this is made of rods. And we have this drum, we call it Dabakan in Gindana, or in Gindana. Then we have the two big hanging gongs there. Uh, we call that agum. And we also have a tiny uh, handheld instrument which is used as a keep, uh, timekeeper of the ensemble called babandil. also explains that Kulintan music has resisted a lot of opposition. Not only Christian and Western influences try to oppose it, but now with a lot of scholars from the southern Philippines going to very conservative Islamic countries, they come back feeling that this type of music shouldn't be played. However, Colin Duyan underscores that this type of music has always been played. The people who practice this type of music embrace Islam religion, but has nothing to do with religion. This music was already there before people became Christian or became Catholic or became Muslim. So the music is not performed for any religious activities in Mindanao among my people. The first piece we spread is called Tapagonor, and in the modern tradition, they perform that to entertain an important guest to the village. So we are, you are our guest this afternoon. If you want to hear this dynamic ensemble, go to www.kulintang.com. Again, that's www.kulintang.com for more information. The Paula Bonian Kulintang Ensemble has a new DVD out, and again, if you go to kulintang.com, you'll be able to check it out, as well as find out more about this wonderful ensemble music. And this is G. Thanks so much for listening. Listening to Apex Express. Next up is a feature by producer John Watanabe. The past ten months have been an emotional roller coaster for longtime Oakland Elementary School music teacher Shirlene Chu. She began the recent school year having to divide her time between three schools Lincoln Elementary, Lockwood Elementary, and the International Community School in the Fruitvale neighborhood, where ninety percent of the students are native Spanish speakers. After a November article in the Wall Street Journal praised both Shirlene and the performance of her Great Wall Youth Orchestra and its rising young star, Tyler Thompson, Shirlene and the orchestra have been busier than ever. Tyler and members of the orchestra even performed recently at San Jose's HP Pavilion in front of 13,000 people and an international television audience. In the following piece, we'll hear from Shirlene and her students. Michael Morgan, musical director of the Oakland East Bay Symphony, and Guillermina Gutierrez, principal of the International Community School. And both Tyler and eight-year-old Kimberly Gonzalez, who is also a member of the orchestra, will sing for us. are also on the faces of people going by. 
which means that people come in. Do they come in rainbows? No, they're colors. People come in different colors. And, and what they're saying is that it's very beautiful, just like a rainbow. And friends are shaking hands. It doesn't matter what color you are. We are all friends. I started teaching at, uh, well, or started working for the Oakland Unified School District in 1975, and my first assignment was here at Lincoln School. So I was a uh, bilingual classroom teacher for over 20 years, and then in 1995, I relinquished my duties in the classroom and became the music prep teacher. The first time I heard Tyler sing was when he was in kindergarten. After I taught the class how to sing, I always asked for volunteers who want to sing by themselves. And, and Tyler raised his hand and he got up and he sang and timing was good, the pitch was good. And his presence was very good. He was very comfortable with singing. My name is Tyler Thompson and I'm nine years old. I'm just an African American Chinese opera of singer. The only time I saw Tyler nervous when he was uh, performing at the uh, HP Pavilion. Before I got on stage, I was like, I can do this and get it over with and then go home and eat. But <laughs> then. Uh, when I got up on stage, I was, my heart was just feeling like this, do, 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 just like this. <laughs> my legs, my legs were just wooden, like, I just, they just wouldn't stop. <laughs> I was, I was just so nervous, I was just so scared. He did very well. Once it gets over 10,000 people, it is, you know, a little nerve-wracking, right? But he was exposed to 1.3 billion people. So Tyler is quite famous in, 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 uh, you know, in China now. Tyler is, is really extraordinary, both for his singing voice, but also just because he's such a great kid and he keeps such a level head through all of this attention that he's getting. So um, I think he's a really extraordinary. And I think there are a lot of extraordinary children in Great Wall and in the schools in Oakland generally. There is no music program in Oakland Public Schools that we can speak of. This year we've been lucky to have um, Miss Shu work with us once a week. You know, kids pick up languages very easily. Especially, you know, at this age, nobody told them that Chinese is a difficult language. And if you ask China, all the people there would say English is difficult. It's uh, what you are used to, what you are exposed to. So if we do not think of it as um, being very difficult and we don't, you know, condition the children to think it is difficult, they can master anything.
when you talk to the kids about the class or when you see, I mean, when you ask them if they like it, no one has said no, of course, and everyone says, and I can sing. You know, I didn't know that I could sing. And f- because Miss Shu is so patient and so, such a good teacher, you know, just besides being a good musician, she's such a wonderful teacher and she really extracts wonderful things from the children. So if you ask the kids in kind- and first grade, for example, um, what do you do in your music class? She, they'll tell you we sing, and they'll tell you we'll sing Chinese opera, and we, we can, I, and I can tell you how to say mushroom in Chinese, you know, and that is just such a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think that it is important to be inclusive when we're talking about teaching kids to respect people of other culture and, you know, from other ethnic background. You know, these things also have to somehow get get it into them. And I think music is a very pleasant way to do it. Food is another. <laughs> if you want to study about someone's culture, and you say, you know, I want to say Japanese culture, you know, it'd be nice to go out and say, hey, you know, this is sushi, and, you know, this tastes good, and, you know, and so on. I think that um, uh, food is one way. Music is another way. It's not the color of our skin that makes us different. What makes us different is our cultural differences. And if we um, have put our efforts into studying and respecting other people's culture, I think that is a first step of going toward the direction of achieving world peace. Great Wall Youth Orchestra will perform in Los Angeles on Saturday, July 23rd at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center at 7.30 p.m. For more information about this event or the Great Wall Youth Orchestra, please visit www.purplesilk.org. For Apex Express, this is John Watanabe. If Fidel Castro and George Bush were going to sit down to eat, Next up is a cut by Indian and Chinese musicians Subramanian and Jie Bing Chen from the city called Global Fusion.
I am here for the Apex Express news and calendar of events. The man behind the infamous tsunami song at New York's Hot 97 has landed right here in the Bay Area. The Hot 97 show's program made what's been called racist remarks about the Asians who suffered during the earthquake and tsunami in Indonesia and in other parts of South Asia. Rick Delgado, the fired producer of Miss Jones in the Morning at Hot 97, is now at K Wild in San Francisco. However, there are numbers and addresses in which people can call to direct their dissatisfaction to uh, his name, Dennis Martinez, at clearchannel.com, or Monica Tsunai at clearchannel.com, or Ray Wong at clearchannel.com. And uh, you might want to talk to Gabby Medic of Regional Marketing. And that telephone number is 415 538 Five six four seven. Continuing on with our calendar events, there's going to be a wonderful music program featuring Asian American jazz and KPFA Zavacha, who is a poet and percussionist at Powell's Place. Emmett Powell has uh, a restaurant at 1521 Eddy Street in the Fillmore in San Francisco. So for more information on that, please go to 415-409-1388 for this evening of wonderful music. A uh, play called The Domestic Crusaders, a two-act family drama about Muslim Pakistani Americans caught up in the drama of post-9-11 and about what's going on with a lot of families who face a discrimination that happened post-9-11. And this drama is going to be happening Friday, July the 15th at 8 p.m. And that's going to be at the Berkeley Repertory Theater in Berkeley. And for more information on that, please go to www.domesticcrusaders.com for more information on this. Also, Disappeared in America is a traveling exhibit that can also be viewed online. It's created by Muslim and South Asian activist artists. They use various media but document real lives torn apart by detentions, dragnets, and deportations. And Asian sounds, dance hall, dub, drum and bass are all in the music of the mall. And this is going to be at Echo Sessions on Saturday, July 16th at the Elbow Room. That's Saturday, July 16th, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. For more information on that, contact www.damalsf.com. That's spelled D-H-A-M-A-A-L-S-F dot C-O-M for ticket and more information. Also, want to just remind folks that the API Hip Hop Show, Apex Out the Box, is right after the uh, on-air show. We're going to be collaborating with Locust Arts Organizations Thursday, July 14th, and that starts at 8 p.m. And for more information on that, you can go to www.locustarts.org. Or, of course, you can always check out the myspace.com backslash Apex Express for more information on the hip-hop show. If you're interested and want to contact Apex, please do so. I'm going to give out some numbers again. That's A-P-E-X at K-P-F-A dot O-R-G or 510-848-6767 extension 464. Or you can also uh, listen to past shows if you just go to www.kpfa. Dot org and go to archives or you can go to the program schedule and click on Apex Express and all the old shows are there. My name is G. This is Apex Express. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley. KPFB and KFCF in Fresno. Um, this is Curtis Liu, and I want to thank G for producing, and John Watanabe as well, and Lawton on the board. I hope to see all of you at the uh, at Locust Arts tonight. Uh, stay tuned for the Bonnie Simmons Show. <laughs>